Wait, wait, so he had the plans with him in the plane? Yeah, but, but didn't Hitler specifically say never do that? But he did anyway. Oh, boy. Well, for his sake, he, he better have died in the crash. Yeah, okay. See ya. June 20th, 1942. It's a name that the world, especially the British, heard last year an awful lot. And it's a name that is on everyone's lips once again this week. Tobruk. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Axis had the beginnings of success in cracking the fortress town of Sevastopol, but they had the beginnings of major success in North Africa, knocking back the Eighth Army and putting it in a dire situation. Two Allied convoys, specifically to help the Allied situation in Africa, left their ports last week for Malta. These are the Harpoon and Vigorous convoys. And as we've seen, the supply situation on Malta all spring has been very serious. The Allies have finally managed to get some planes in lately to defend the island against the seemingly endless Axis bombing campaign. But Malta needs supplies if it is to survive, hence the convoys. Alban Curtis leads Harpoon Convoy from Gibraltar the 11th. Six merchant ships escorted by the battleship Malaya, carriers Eagle and Argus, four cruisers and 17 destroyers. Philip Vian leads Vigorous Convoy from Port Said, Haifa and Alexandria, also starting the 11th. He has eight cruisers and 26 destroyers to cover 11 merchant ships. Vigorous is hit by air first on the 13th. Torpedo boats join in on the 14th, sinking a destroyer. Air attacks the 15th, sink two more destroyers. The merchants are now down to six ships. Ammunition is running low, and they discover that Italian battleships Littorio and Vittorio Veneto are on their way with cruiser and destroyer escorts. The convoy turns back. On the 16th, the cruiser Hermione is sunk by a U-boat. German and Italian planes attack Harpoon on the 14th. On the 15th, the convoy escort is only a close escort of cruisers and destroyers, and they are again attacked. Two destroyers and three merchant ships are sunk. Only two merchant ships reach Malta the 16th. The tanker Kentucky is one of the ships sunk, which means no new aviation fuel arrives for the dwindling RAF stocks. The British do get a bit of revenge when Littorio is damaged by air attack and an Italian heavy cruiser is sunk by a submarine. This whole thing has been a bit of a relief though for the British 8th Army fighting in North Africa during the whole time, since most of the German planes in North Africa have been involved in hunting the convoys. This is not to say the situation for the Allies is by any means easy down there. On the 14th, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill asks Middle Eastern Theater Commander Claude Auchinleck by telegram, to what position does Ritchie want to withdraw the Gazala troops? Presume there is no question in any case of giving up Tobruk. Neil Ritchie commands the 8th Army in North Africa. Auchinleck replies the 15th, I have no intention whatever of giving up Tobruk. Now, we saw the seemingly endless siege of Tobruk last year, month after month. And already back in February this year, both Auchinleck and Ritchie agreed that should Axis Commander Erwin Rommel mount a successful offensive, they would not try to hold Tobruk again. Another such siege and the huge drain on resources it would entail was not an option. So the general plans were to avoid being pushed into any such position, into which they now have been pushed. But giving up Tobruk, the epic story of the siege had been a huge morale boost back home. And how would people react now if they just gave it up? Auchinleck thinks that Rommel must now be close to exhaustion, short on ammunition, and unable to maintain the pace of his attacks. So he orders Ritchie to hold Tobruk and hold the line Akroma El Adam Bir Gubi. Well, Ritchie has the 50th Division and the 1st South African Division, who, as we saw, were mostly isolated last week, withdrawn from the Gazala line. That begins the night of the 14th. The South Africans along the coast and the 50th south around Bir Hakim, then through the desert to the frontier. Ritchie has also ordered the supply dump at Bel Ahmed destroyed should the enemy get close. There is nearly 6 million liters of gasoline there and they'd prefer Rommel not getting his hands on it. So, the British situation so far, once all the forces west of Akroma have been evacuated, is that they've been driven back 
130 kilometers to a line from Tobruk to El Adam to desert. Rommel has, of course, detected the withdrawal and thinks they're pulling back to the Egyptian border. He reports this to Ettore Bastico, his superior, and gets the order to take Tobruk. The Axis also cannot have another long siege there, because they plan on withdrawing the Luftwaffe to help take Malta soon, and since Hitler has banned troop transports by sea until that happens, Rommel is not getting any reinforcements that could mount a long siege. He's already planning on attacking anyhow, though. He sends the 90th Light towards El Adam and the 21st Panzers toward Bel Ahmed the 15th. Rommel writes to his wife already that day, The battle has been won and the enemy is breaking up. We're now mopping up encircled remnants of their army. I needn't tell you how delighted I am. Those attacks are stopped, actually. But the next day, the 21st Panzers break through towards Bel Ahmed, leaving El Adam vulnerable, and it is evacuated that night. This leaves the Gambut airfield vulnerable now, and the British Desert Air Force is withdrawn to Sidi Aziz and then further east to Sidi Barani. This, though, compromises air support for all of 8th Army. The Axis advance continues, and Bel Ahmed is evacuated the night of the 17th, though the fuel has been dumped into the desert. Rommel's armor reaches the coast that night, and Tobruk is once again surrounded. In fact, the British are cleared 65 kilometers eastward from it, and it is once again under siege. Rommel tells Berlin this the 18th and asks for Luftwaffe help in eliminating it as quickly as possible. Area Luftwaffe commander Smiling Albert Kesselring will assist, in fact, he even brings in planes from Greece and Crete for the operation, which is to use every bomber unit in North Africa as well. The Axis have a continuous perimeter by land around Tobruk. Also the 18th, Auchinleck flies in to discuss the situation with Ritchie. What General Auchinleck found was that a complete disaster had overtaken Ritchie's command. Tobruk was surrounded, 8th Army had been virtually evicted from Libya, and the employment of a force capable of mounting any counterattack was just wishful thinking. Rommel orders his attack to begin today, the 20th, and Tobruk in 1942 is not the same fortress as Tobruk in 1941 was. That February decision to not hold it meant it had not been maintained or beefed up as a strong point. Barbed wire and minefields were removed and used on the Gazala line, and even some of the anti-tank ditches collapsed or, or were filled in. There are two brigades of the 2nd South African Division there, as well as the 201st Guards Brigade, the 11th Indian Infantry, and administration units. There are no planes, and not very much AA either to stop enemy planes. There are tons of supplies thousands of tons of them, 7,000 tons of water, one and a half million liters of fuel, and three million food rations within the 48 kilometer perimeter. On the night of the 19th, Rommel brings the Africa Corps around to the eastern perimeter for the first big assault. At 5.20 this morning, an artillery barrage begins. It is soon joined by dive bombers. The infantry move in at 7 a.m. and attack the outer defenses and give cover to engineers who set up crossings of the anti-tank ditches. By 8 a.m., tanks are through and are hitting the main defenses. Just before noon, they break through the final barriers and by 1 p.m. are closing in on King's Cross, the intersection of the El Adam and Bardia roads. By 2 p.m., units are eight kilometers from the harbor and are shelling the town itself. By the end of the afternoon, tanks are in the town and the infantry is mopping up resistance and preventing any escapes from the port. Meanwhile, at 4 p.m., 15th Panzer Division is closing in on General H.B. Clopper's headquarters. He's in charge of the defenses. He orders the radios and phone exchange destroyed. However, the Panzers head southwest to instead hit the rear of some as yet untouched defenders. Clopper decides to set up a new command post to the northwest, but, you know, now he's got real communications issues since he just had them destroyed. At 8 p.m., he gets word to all units that he can that they are to prepare for mass breakout over the night. Some units with transport try to get away to the west, but those without transport are trapped. Jumping a few hours into the future, at around 5 tomorrow morning, Clopper will decide that further resistance is useless, and by mid-morning, everyone has gotten the order to lay down their arms. Tobruk surrenders. It held out for seven months last year, but now just one day. Some units do not stop fighting, though, and around 400 men manage to escape and fight their way all the way to Egypt, one group taking a full 38 days to do so. 
33,000 prisoners are taken by the Axis, and the attack is too quick for the defenders to destroy the supplies. So most of them are taken as well, including 2,000 vehicles of various kinds. In one fell swoop, South Africa has just lost a third of their forces in the field. This is a catastrophic blow to British morale. Winston Churchill has recently arrived in Washington when he gets the news, and he is stunned. The battles at Gazala and Tobruk were a humiliating experience for the Eighth Army. It had met the enemy on ground more or less of its own choosing. It had begun by possessing a considerable numerical advantage, particularly in armor. At one time, it had had Rommel at its mercy, and yet it had once again been defeated in detail. As for Erwin Rommel and Panzer Armee Africa, his fame is now global for conquering Libya and devastating Eighth Army. He is immediately promoted to General Feldmarschall and is unquestionably Germany's most famous general. All wonder far and wide, what will his next triumph be? However, he's not the only German advancing this week. In the Battle of Sevastopol, on the 17th, Fort Siberia falls to the Axis. The 18th, Fort Maxim Gorky falls. The 20th, Fort Lenin falls. On just the 17th, actually, 54th Corps finally has some real success capturing six Soviet fortifications on the north side. Over the next few days, they managed to take the whole north shore of Severnaya Bay, but at the cost of very heavy casualties. By this time, the Soviet garrison in general is running low on supplies and men, but ships run the gauntlet and bring in ammunition and 3,000 men. But they can't keep that up forever. On the other hand, destroying a fort means blowing it out of the ground where they're anchored with steel and concrete, and some are hundreds of meters long, so this is taking time. Here is an interesting development from the Eastern Front this week. On the 19th, Major Reichel, 23rd Panzer Division's operations officer, is in a small plane that crash lands just inside Soviet lines around 100 kilometers northeast of Kharkov. Contrary to Adolf Hitler's explicit instructions about not carrying orders on planes, Reichel has in his briefcase the general outline for phase one of Fall Blau, the impending huge German offensive, and the operational orders for 40th Panzer Corps. Once they discover he's missing, a German patrol goes out searching. They find the wrecked plane, but not him. Reichel does not only, of course, carry Fall Blau in his papers, he carries it in his head as well. So not finding him either dead or alive is a pretty serious deal. The reality is that everyone aboard the plane dies in the crash. But Soviet infantry does find the briefcase. The papers are sent up the chain of command. Southwestern Front transmits the contents to Bryansk Front and sends the documents themselves to Moscow. The reason for transmitting to Bryansk is so Filip Golikov, who runs the show there, knows that 40th Panzer Corps will attack from Volchansk to Novi Oskol, will send its main forces against Ostrogorsk and is aiming as its goal at Voronezh. The German hammer is going to fall at the junction of the Bryansk and Southwestern fronts. That much is obvious. The general staff, its gaze riveted on Golikov's northern wing, had been disastrously wrong in its estimate of German intentions. And now to back up the information obtained from the Reichel papers, Soviet reconnaissance planes were bringing in aerial photos of considerable German concentration. According to the papers, that attack will begin on the 22nd, two days from now. Something else that begins this week is the Manhattan Project. Okay, it's not called that until August. The US Army Chief of Engineers, Eugene Raybould, chooses James Marshall to run the US Army's part of this joint effort with the British. Marshall sets up temporary headquarters in New York where he can get assistance from the Army Corps of Engineers. So the project is informally known as the Manhattan Engineer District. What this is, is a research and development project to see if nuclear weapons are possible and to try and build them. More on this as it develops. We also have a special that talks about it in more detail. We do, actually. I don't know when that comes out, but we do. So, okay. 
With that, I will now leave you for this week, a week of great Axis gains in North Africa and small ones in the Crimea. And Tobruk Falls, in just one day. What a hit for British morale after such a brave and spirited siege defense last year. Rommel just walked all over 8th Army. You know that a lot of people are asking themselves right now, can anything really stop the Germans? And I don't mean just people in Britain. In the USSR and high command, they now know that very soon Germany and its allies are going to launch a huge new offensive. Knowing that it's going to happen doesn't mean that you can stop it. So I'm sure there are plenty of Russians asking themselves that same question right now. Can anything really stop the Germans? The Manhattan Project may be a beginning of nuclear weapon manufacturing, but if you'd like to see what was going on with nuclear weapons down the road a bit, check out our Day Zero episode of the Cuban Missile Crisis Day by Day we did the other year. Yeah, last year. You can check it out right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is David Uzomian, which is a cool name. It is thanks to David and the Army that we can make this series, the Cuba series, and all of our series. So join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Do not forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.